What's up and welcome to a Small Stars Science Reality video. Even if you're not into space stuff or science fiction, I think you'll find the mothership and its potential to be very interesting. I'm calling it Science Reality because it's something that seems like a futuristic fantasy at first glance, but is actually possible right now. Despite its enormity and lack of precedence, we can build the mothership and make it work. But I gotta hit you with the quick disclaimer here, this is purely a concept. The design of the mothership is just for illustration and for us to have fun. Any idea this wild is sure to go through many iterations, but even at this stage I think it will be enjoyable to learn about how the mothership works. We'll discuss the general concept, like why is it this shape, and the functions of the different parts. And then we'll touch on some of the major challenges, like the logistics of building this behemoth, and how we would go about actually pushing this thing to a destination like Mars or the moons of Jupiter. I'll also point out a number of problems ranging from small design issues to the mothership's fundamental dilemma. And I do appreciate the debate and all of your comments, especially ones that point out complications I haven't thought of. I chose to design the mothership specifically for SpaceX, firstly because it's quite literally a starship carrier, but also because of this. To really appreciate what you're watching here, you have to realize that this rocket is nearly as tall as a 15-story building and it's landing on an American football field sized boat. You see why SpaceX would be the number one choice for bringing an out of the box idea to life. Okay, so check it out. The whole idea of the mothership is that it holds 48 starships and provides artificial gravity. If each starship accommodates 100, that means the mothership could carry almost 5,000 humans at capacity in its double saucer configuration. It may surprise you that most of the mothership is empty space. The less massive it is, the less mass the rocket engines have to push against to change velocity. In other words, the bigger the whole thing is, the harder it is to push to another planet and stop there when it arrives. The two saucer sections are connected to each other at the center and can only be separated in an emergency, just like the Enterprise D. The mothership actually has no bridge, but one of the starships will be designated the command ship and have control over the mothership's functions. Let's go through how the operations would work. Once every starship is docked, all of the starships on one of the saucers actuate, rotating on their pins to match orientation with the rest. Now all engines are facing in the same direction. Synchronized and controlled by the command ships, all 48 starships fire their engines, and the mothership is now changing velocity. Yes, the mothership relies on existing starship engines to move. You may be thinking, hey, with the added mass of the mothership, the starships will all run out of propellant before any useful new trajectory is achieved. And you would be right, except that the mothership, lacking its own engines, would contain tanks that feed extra fuel into the starships. Even so, I know that moving such an enormous mass is a major hang-up for the mothership thanks to the tyranny of the rocket equation. If you're not familiar with this concept, I can sum it up by saying it's tough to budget fuel for rockets. You get into a repeating problem where the more fuel you add to a design, the more fuel you need to push the mass of the fuel you added. We'll talk about overcoming this problem in a few minutes, but I still think the best design for a gigantic ship like this is for it to not have its own engines because that adds extra mass for those engines to push. When the synchronized burn is complete and turned off by the command ship, the mothership will be bidding farewell to Earth and beginning its long journey to let's say Jupiter in this demonstration. Now is when the fun stuff begins for us gravity nerds. The docks rotate all starships to a flat position, lining their feet up with what I'm calling the load pads. Foot pad just didn't sound right, and these things actually do hold the load or the weight of each starship once gravity kicks in. The doors can now close and the saucers begin the spin. If you notice, they're spinning in opposite directions. While floating through space, this is actually a really great way to use the sun's energy to create gravity. All it has to do is counter push on each saucer in opposite directions, kind of like when you twist open a jar of tomato sauce. Why I say the motor can be small is because we want it to be as lightweight as possible, and with a theoretical multi-year journey to Jupiter, unlike our mass limit, our time limit has plenty of breathing room. Eventually, even if it takes days to speed up, the motors would get the saucer spinning at whatever the target speed is to create the desired amount of artificial gravity force. While even a small amount of gravity is beneficial to human health, I personally would prefer the full amount of Earth's gravity so that I can maintain as much strength as possible while I'm off-world. 
This is why the design has a spin radius of 224 meters. Each saucer only needs to rotate at two rotations per minute to provide a full 1G where the passengers are. There would be slightly less gravity at the nose of each starship and slightly more in the cargo hold and fuel tanks, but nothing too crazy. If a person exited their starship and climbed down to the edge of the saucer, they would experience 1.24G at that location. So let's fast forward a bunch of years and a few gravity assists later depending on the flight plan. The humans have now aged well, thanks to the artificial gravity provided by the mothership, but also the precious radiation protection provided by her hull. Not to mention, there would be a real sense of community among the thousands of people across the 48 connected starships. When the mothership arrives at the Jovian system, the operations that were performed before leaving Earth are executed again in reverse. Once the doors are fully open, the docks rotate on their pins again facing the starship's butts in the right direction for an orbital insertion burn. All engines fire and sink again, adjusting the mothership's velocity so that it literally sticks around at Jupiter. The 48 starships can now top themselves off from whatever fuel reserves are left in the mothership tanks and undock so that they may explore Jupiter's system, perhaps dividing up into groups and landing on various moons. You may be saying at this point, why go through all the trouble of building such a colossal project just to provide artificial gravity? Well, while it is its main feature, gravity isn't the mothership's only purpose. But gravity is super important. Check out my gravity options video where I go in depth about why artificial gravity is such a good thing. I make some convincing arguments about why it should be considered a necessity for long duration space missions. Plus, if you're interested in exactly how spinning creates artificial gravity and its practicality, I give a simple and concise explanation in that video. Aside from gravity, the mothership provides other benefits too, like radiation protection and a physical connection to backup equipment and possibly even backup whole starships. The concept of many starships all taking a journey at once is actually based on SpaceX's plans to colonize Mars. According to Elon Musk, because of how the orbits of Earth and Mars line up, the transfer window may one day be taken advantage of by sending waves of 1,000 starships every 26 months. Now let's talk about building the thing. As of spring 2020, the proposed starship, which itself hasn't even been fully realized, is designed to be 55 meters tall. My first design iteration of the mothership concept that you see here is around 500 meters in diameter and 60 meters tall from center cap to center cap. But the full mothership is two saucers, so make that 120 meters tall. And yes, with this configuration, there would probably be an engine scorching problem because the bottom starships all fire their hot exhaust into the bottom hull of the top saucer. But no matter how that problem gets solved, this project would be record-breakingly huge. Building it would take years and a plethora of construction launches. My vision for the frame, which is basically the skeleton of the ship, is that it could be built out from sections, each section being small enough to fit in the payload bay of a starship. The hull construction is where it gets a bit trickier though, because like all the parts, it needs to be modular so that it can be launched in pieces and constructed in space, but also needs to implement solar panels, radiation protection, and heat control. Getting into some of the other glaring problems that I know need to be worked on, not in any particular order, problem one, the actuating docks. How can they support all of the force exerted on them by the starships during engine burns? Well, there would have to be an apparatus that connected the strongest parts of the starship structures to the docks. In my render, I tried to make the docks look soft, kind of like, I don't know, a Bigelow inflatable, but they would need rigid parts that connect to take force from the starships and transfer that force to the mothership's frame. Problem two, how can all of this thrust from the outer ring not make the whole mothership bend, leaving the middle of it behind during engine burns? Well, it probably will bend a bit no matter what but hopefully the mass of the center parts of the system can be kept extremely low so that an additional thrust source doesn't have to be added to the middle of the mothership to balance it out. Problem three, will these people ever see the sun again? Well, maybe not. The sun and cosmic rays are very bad for your health when you're outside of the Earth's Van Allen radiation belt. I'm not exactly sure what the best design for this is, but I currently have the whole thing as a closed ship to protect against radiation. Problem four, what about getting back home to Earth? Well, it may be feasible to refine rocket propellant on these distant worlds and refill the mothership's tanks. But this could also just be a one-way trip for the mothership, 
turning it into a home-based space station orbiting at the destination. This will be especially useful when exploring worlds in our solar system that are super far from Earth, super cold, and have low gravity. More on this in a moment, but first, problem five, probably the biggest issue of them all, so I saved it for last, total mass slash weight. I already spoke about the tyranny of the rocket equation. One possibility to mitigate this is perhaps having the outer hull cover only the habitable outer ring, so that each saucer is more of a donut shape with just the skeleton connecting it to the center. But even so, any extra mass that the starships have to push to a destination will greatly affect the mothership's range. Perhaps by the time something like the mothership is actually built, we'll have a much more efficient fusion drive engine that just obliterates the tyranny of the rocket equation. Which brings us to the conclusion. Let's take a look at the big picture. If a new generation of fusion drive or some other powerful but more efficient rocket engines do get developed in the near future, the mothership concept will really become viable. But that still doesn't mean we should rush into building it. 4,000 humans is a nice number for people settling Mars, but then one must ask, is the cost of the mothership worth it? it? Would cost a fortune, and I would say yes, especially if it could be reused and make two-way trips. But I think the best use for a system like this is for traveling to extremely far away worlds. But then you might be asking, should 4,000 humans even be exploring places like Jupiter's moons? The distance from the sun is so great that surface temperatures on Europa, for example, never rise above negative 260 degrees Fahrenheit, or negative 160 Celsius. This would be more of a science expedition than a migration. But even so, the mothership concept really shines for this application. Destinations like Jupiter, Saturn, and beyond theoretically could call for generational missions because it takes so many years to travel that far. It would be extremely beneficial to have additional humans on board for such a mission, right? Not only that, but many of the smaller moons and asteroids have very low gravity, making it cheap to land and launch repeatedly from their surfaces. Science teams could explore these worlds for hours at a time, and then blast off, returning to the much healthier and safer environment aboard the spinning mothership. I'm all for space exploration, and I say sure, let's spend billions of dollars going to Mars the way that SpaceX is currently planning to. But as much as I love science reality, in my opinion, if we collectively have an extra fortune to spend, we should put it towards stabilizing climate change and managing our pollution first before building a mothership. Once the Earth's environment is safe and sustainable, let's go ahead and become our future selves, exploring the unknown in gigantic spaceships. In the meantime, I'll be devising new ideas for how to safely get humans to other planets and how to improve the mothership to make it more practical. I'll be sure to make new videos with updated specs when new Starship information gets released. And also when I get new ideas from you guys in the comments, like I usually do. I just launched a Patreon page, so if you're interested in joining our chat community, please check the link in the description. Thanks to all the subscribers for keeping our channel going, and thank you for watching. I sincerely hope you enjoyed this video. Open your mind and reach for the stars.